I think we need to get started. We've had uh, some last minute oh, con. Please, you make the other jury won't be chair. <laughs> we had some last minute conflicts. Uh, Greg Nesbitt is not attending tonight. Sean is out of the, out of state, and so is Mark. So they're attending electronically, and hopefully we get all the pieces together at some point so that we can hear them and they can hear us. But I think we should get started. Council will now call to order the application of Outlook Outback Steakhouse for an intermunicipal transfer of a liquor license. There are currently no liquor license available in Horsham Township for Outback, which is planning to open a restaurant at 720 Blair Mill Road. Therefore, the applicant has elected to apply for the transfer of a liquor license, which is currently allocated to another municipality. The Pennsylvania Liquor Code provides that we as Horsham Township Council must hold a hearing to allow council and residents the opportunity to ask questions and voice their opinions on the proposed transfer. Following testimony, council must decide whether the transfer would be beneficial or detrimental to the health, common welfare, peace, and morals of the township or its residents. Council will first hear the testimony of an applicant, and then we'll ask the applicant to be available for questions and comments. With that brief introduction, I'll ask the applicant's attorney Mr. Kozar to proceed with the presentation of this case. Mr. Kozar. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, my name is Mark Kozar. I'm with the law firm of Flaherty and O'Hara. Uh, I like to plug our law firm every chance I get, and uh, our sole area of practice is liquor law and liquor licensing. We do it throughout the state and across the country. Uh, tonight I'm here on behalf of Outback to request that you pass a resolution permitting the intermunicipal transfer of a license from outside Horsham Township to within it, pursuant to the revised liquor code, uh, section 461B3, uh, for use uh, by Outback at a new location, as you mentioned, at 720 Blair Mill Road. Uh, as you are aware, uh, the liquor code now permits the PLCB to approve the transfer of a liquor license from <clears throat> any municipality within Montgomery County to a different municipality in the county, so long as you the receiving municipality issues a resolution permitting that transfer. <clears throat> In order for you to make a, a decision on uh, my request, uh, let me provide you a little bit of background on Outback Steakhouse. The parent company of Outback Steakhouse is Blooming Brands, which owns and operates nearly 1,500 restaurants in 47 states and 15 countries. I'm sure you're familiar with their other uh, there are other brands. Uh, they own and operate Bonefish Grill, Carabas Italian Grill, and Fleming's Prime Steakhouse in addition to Outback. Uh, there are 848 Outback restaurants uh, in those 47 states and 15 countries. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have 25 Outbacks in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you haven't been Outback, it is a family-friendly table service restaurant offering a casual dining experience with an Australian uh, inspired decor. The menu offers seven different cuts of steak seasoned uh, with a spice blend created by the restaurant's founders 30 years ago. Uh, the menu provides a broad range of other food options uh, including seafood, chicken, ribs, pork chops, plus both gluten-free and vegetarian offerings and Obviously, their trade, their trademark Bloomin' Onion, uh, which everybody loves. Uh, alcoholic beverages are offered at uh, all Outback restaurants, uh, which makes for a consistent national product. Alcohol is sold in a responsible manner as a complement to the food. On average, alcohol sales make up only 14% of the total sales of Outback restaurants. All managers and uh, alcohol servers are trained in the uh, PLCB's RAMP program, which stands for Responsible Alcohol Management. Uh, teaches the servers how to identify fake IDs, uh, to watch out for visibly intoxicated persons, and pass off situations where somebody who's 21 is, is giving alcohol to somebody under 21. Uh, the hours of operation will be Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., Fridays and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and on Sundays, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. There's no live music at Outback, no takeout beer. Um, 
Outback is a well-respected family casual restaurant which provides the residents of the township an outstanding dining alternative. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Do you have any questions? I do not. No. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Okay. Then can we close the hearing at this point? Yes. yes. All right. If there's no questions, then we'll close the hearing and we will vote on this presentation a little later in the meeting. Thank you. At this point, we're going to hold a hearing under an ordinance which, is, if adopted, would amend the zoning ordinance to create a mini storage facility use, to amend the zoning map to rezone two properties from R3 to I1. This amendment was requested by the applicant who would like to install a mini storage facility at 901 Horsham Road, a parcel we all know as the former Joseph's Catering property. The ordinance has been reviewed by the Township Planning Commission, the Montgomery County Planning Commission, the Township Engineer, the Township Landscape Architect, and the Township Land Planner. The hearing for the ordinance has been advertised for this evening. This hearing is not an adjudicative hearing, so no stenographer is present this evening. This hearing is your opportunity to learn about the ordinance from the applicant and let council know if you have an opinion on the proposed ordinance. The applicant is present this evening to again present the project to the council and to the public. I'll we'll ask that the applicant's attorney, Julie von Spreckelston, provide an overview of the ordinance. There will then be an opportunity for comment from council and I will ask for public comment. Uh, is there any? Go ahead, outside. Thank you very I'll much. turn it over to Julie. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Julie Von Spreckelson from the law firm of Eastburn and Gray here tonight on behalf of Insight Property Group, which is the equitable owner of 901 Horsham Road, and which property is one of the properties that is subject of this proposed zoning ordinance text and map amendment. Um, joining me this evening, immediately to my left, is Elias Slaby. He is the Director of East Coast Site Development on behalf of Insight Property Group. And to his left is Justin Giannotti, who is the Project Civil Engineer from Dynamic Engineering. Um, we have a very brief PowerPoint that I wanted to run through with you, and this provides um, a concept for a redevelopment of this property if this proposed zoning ordinance text and map amendment is in fact adopted by council. So going to the second page that you have on the screen, just very briefly, this is an um, introduction into the Insight Property Group team. And though based out of Torrance, California, the company develops, operates, manages uh, commercial real estate throughout the United States, focusing on self-storage facilities and the development, um, like I said, throughout the United States, and they have projects ongoing right now, both in Bucks and Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. If you switch to the next slide, please. This slide shows the existing site conditions of 901 Horsham Road, and really what this is showing you is the severe uh, development constraints of this property. First, you can see it's a pretty irregularly shaped property, and then the colored portions of the property that shows all of the natural resources that exist on this property and that cannot be developed. So you can see it's a pretty large area. In fact, this property is over five and a half acres, but over two and a half acres cannot be developed on this site. You can see the Davis Grove tributary that runs through the south of the property. We have floodplain area. There's wetland transition area, and there's also woodlands on this site. So it's a really large portion of the site that remains undevelopable. And in addition to those constraints, we also have the zoning constraint. And what I mean by that is, as indicated, this property is currently zoned R3. And R3 is low density residential. And basically, the only thing that can be developed on an R3 property is a single family dwelling. Otherwise, it would be a municipal use, such as a municipal building or park or something of that nature. And as you further know, this has been, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Whiteside, this property has been used for years as the Joseph's Catering site. So that's an existing non-conforming use. So it's not an R3 use of the property as it exists today, and it hasn't been for years and years. Um, so again, 
both zoning and environmental constraints of this property. And the zoning portion of it leads to my next slide, which if you can turn to the next slide, what this is, this is a snapshot of the zoning map as it exists today. And the yellow border that you see, those are all zoned I-1. All those properties are zoned I-1 except the red. And you can see it's almost like the hole in the donut. So all the surrounding zoning is I-1 except those two properties. And 901 is the larger portion that you can see there. That's 901. And then immediately adjacent to it is 925. Now 925 Horsham Road is also subject of this um, text and map amendment. And 925, again, zoned R3, also has an existing non-conforming use and has one for many years. It is the eye care associates use and obviously used as an eye doctor's office. So again, two non-conforming uses on two properties that are zoned R3 with all of the other zoning around it um, being I-1. So you can see that it makes good planning sense to rezone those two portions or those two properties to I-1 so that they're consistent with the other properties in the area. And not only are the other properties I-1, you can see that along Horsham Road, all those properties along Horsham Road on that side of this Horsham Road are industrial zoning. So we have I-2, we have I-1, we have I-3. Um, so it's consistently zoned along Horsham Road as industrial zoning. And so to rezone those two parcels makes a lot of sense. It makes planning sense. If you can turn to the next slide. So the next slide um, shows a concept of what could be developed at the property if the zoning ordinance text and map amendment is adopted. Um, it's a concept plan, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, because if this zoning ordinance text and map amendment is adopted, then um, of course the developer would come back with fully engineered plans. This just being a concept again. And you can see the, the natural resource area is respected. There are significant buffers and berms, and there is a lot of green area that would remain on this site. With regard to the mini storage use um, portion of the text amendment, that fits in with the zoning as well, the I zoning as well. It's an industrial use, and um, if you look at the other uses in the I zone, which include warehousing and wholesale and storage and such, this use fits right within those other uses. Um, if we would switch to the next slide. Now the next few slides, those are all various orientations. Just uh, again, all conceptual that if the ordinance amendment is adopted, um, this is, is something of what the project could end up looking like. So that first view is from the entrance as you're entering in from Horsham Road. If you would please turn to the next slide, that shows the Horsham Road frontage of the property. The next slide shows, um, that's facing west, so that would be facing the 925 Horsham Road property. The next slide shows facing east, which would face the high school. And then finally, or not finally, there's a couple more actually, excuse me. Um, you're entering from Horsham, Horsham Road, so this just shows a more um, you know, further back view from Horsham Road of entrance into the site. And then the next slide shows more of an elevated view as you're looking down. And so tried to show more of the, the buffer and the berm that's gonna be there with the enhanced landscaping and the sidewalks that would be along there as well. And then finally, the last one shows another view, again, from Horsham Road. And then if you turn to the last two slides, 13 and 14, so those slides just show the various building elevations. The north elevation, again, being the one that would face Horsham Road. The west elevation would face the 925 Horsham Road. And then the next slide shows the south elevation facing the rear of the property and the east elevation, um, which faces the high school. Um, and that's the extent of our PowerPoint. I did want to point out two additional items. Um, we did uh, receive the township planner letter. 
Uh, that was dated 627-2022, um, very supportive of this zoning ordinance text and map amendment. And we agree with all of the comments that were contained in his letter. And then we also, as Mr. Whiteside mentioned, the Planning Commission held its meeting last week and they recommended adoption of the text and map am amendment unanimously. The township planner was at that meeting and he reiterated um, his support for this ordinance amendment. He said, basically, the rezoning is a no-brainer. Makes sense. These properties are not zoned correctly as they exist today, so it's, it's a no-brainer. And then with regard to the mini uh, storage facility use, he uh, said that it's low traffic impact, low profile operation, low parking requirement, low impact on municipal services, and it's a really good fit for this district and for this property. So with that, that would conclude our presentation. Again, we have a representative from Insight here this evening as well as a project civil engineer is happy to answer any questions anyone may have. All right, Terry, you have any questions? No, I, I just have one. You showed a lot of landscaping and buffering in your photos. Is the expectation that the completed project would be similar to what you're showing us in the photos? That's correct. Okay. Does anybody from the audience have any comments or questions before we close this? Do you have anything? Uh, nobody else does up here on the screen. I was just... Uh, this really cuts through a pretty much the center of town. I just want to know what your guys' long-term strategic interests are in the property. Is this like a warehouse where you guys build and then sell short-term, or is this a long-term investment for uh, the property? Uh, this is a long-term investment. We build, manage, and hold for the long-term. You hear that, Sean? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so you're going to be building, just to reiterate, you're going to be building and maintaining this. Um, your renderings look good, but I just want to make sure this isn't like your initial renderings and then you guys pass these off in a few years and we're kind of responsible for maintaining. No, if it's on our property and we show it, we're going to maintain it. Thank you. Okay. All right, then if there's no further questions, we'll close this hearing so we can move on to our regular meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, shall we call our meeting to order and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first order this evening and in my opinion, the best part of the whole agenda is to recognize Garrett Sable for earning his eagle, uh, earning his his eagle badge. And we're going to talk about his project at the Kohler Park Gazebo. And one of the reasons it's the best part for me is um, I was an assistant scoutmaster in Troop Three for a number of years, and the best parts of that was watching the boys. Uh, go through their badges and, and earn their way and get their eagle and do their projects. So congratulations to you. Uh, Mr. Walker, do you have some background information here? Sure. I, I'm going to let, um, we'll let Garrett explain his whole project. Um, but I think everyone knows how um, the importance of an Eagle Scout is. And um, very few Boy Scouts reach the level of Eagle Scout. Um, we have few come in front of us um, for Eagle Scout. So it's a major accomplishment for any young man to um, um, do. Um, but this is even more special to us because, as we all know, Garrett is our former director of finance, um, Rich Sable's son. Um, so it's even more of an honor to recognize him this evening for the project that he did in Kohler Park. And we can turn it over to Garrett um, if you want to come up to the mic and tell everyone about what an Eagle Scout is and what your project was. Well, so I, uh, I didn't prepare a speech for today, but I'm just going to wing it. So hopefully everyone's okay with that. Um, I think, uh, well, obviously, I'm very proud to be an Eagle Scout. Uh, it really means a lot to me. 
uh, ever since you know I was uh, really young, I always wanted to be an Eagle Scout. Um, my dad was an Eagle Scout, and I that was always something that I looked up. Um, you know, when like when I was with him and everything. So, um, my my dad always said that uh, he wanted me to pick a project where I could go back someday and look at it and be proud. And um, and he, uh, when he was still working here, he saw the gazebo in Color Park. And he said, you should paint that for your project. So um, after, you know, not really getting things done and moving really slowly and dragging my feet, I finally, um, finally got everything together. I bought paint, uh, white paint, and um, Laurel came out to help me with my project, which she you know, doesn't like to help me often. And <laughs> my mom came out, which was very nice. And um, many other scouts and, uh, and leaders came out. And um, the hardest part about the project, I'd say, was definitely the scraping, which took hours. Um, I really didn't anticipate how hard it was going to be, just the scraping. And then, you know, once we got that done, we ate a little bit of pizza, always good. And then, um, and then, we, uh, and then we painted the gazebo in about an hour or so. And um, by the end of it, I was, uh, I was pretty proud of how it, you know, how it ended up. And um, I'm glad that the township thought I did a good job, because if they didn't, you know, probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, but yeah uh that that was my project and i'm really proud of uh of the work i did and um and the scouts that helped me and everything and i'm i'm glad that i uh got my eagle scout i, I was i was cutting it kind of close to the wire but i was just you know just able to get it in so thank you for that okay. you know those projects are designed so that you have to organize something and lead a group of people to get the job done. And it sounds like you made it and did a good job. So yeah. congratulations on that. Thank you. Now, we have a proclamation for you, which I'll read here in a second. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to let you take it with you tonight okay. because we had some unexpected. <laughs> so when we get everybody to sign it, we'll have it framed and get it to you. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate it. So it says, be it proclaimed, whereas, the vision of the Boy Scouts of America is to prepare youth in America to become responsible, participating citizens and leaders who are guided by the Scout Oath and, and Scout Law. And whereas, the Boy Scouts of America encourage Eagle Scout candidates to complete worthy projects to improve their neighborhoods, their community, and their region. And whereas, the rank of Eagle Scout is the highest award a Scout can receive, few boys move up through the ranks of Scouting with only 2% earning this honor since its inception in 1912. And whereas, for his community service project with Doylestown Troop 48, Garrett Sable directed a group of 16 scouts and volunteers through the process of restoring the gazebo located in Horsham Township's Kohler Park. And whereas, Kohler Park Gazebo Restoration Project required community service hours, project management skills, solicitation of supply donations, and his strong leadership abilities. Through achievement of the Eagle Scout Award, Garrett provides a positive example for others and establishes a foundation to become a lifelong leader in the community and whereas Horsham Township Council deems it an honor and a privilege to extend to Garrett Sable our sincerest congratulations for his achievement to Eagle Scout and express our thanks for his work in the Horsham Township community. Hereby set our hands to this seal on the 13th day of July, 2022. So, congratulations again. Why don't we take a moment here? You want to get some pictures? Yes, sir. We'll get some pictures uh, of us with you and your family. And then, um, like I say, we'll get this signed and get it to you. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Next item is a presentation on the Montgomery County Agricultural Land Preservation Program. We've got Stephen Zabinski from MCPC Farm Preser Preservation Planner 2. Okay. Steve, can you just tell me when to go with the slides? And sure, we'll go, yeah. You want to just probably introduce yourself a little yes. bit? Yes, yeah. Um, I'm Stephen Zabinski. I'm with the Montgomery County Planning Commission. Uh, on the farmland preservation planner. Uh, and I'm Ann Linda Gruberger. I am the section manager for county planning at the Montgomery County Planning Commission, and I help out when I can with the farmland preservation work. Yeah. And this is just a presentation, um, a very brief presentation on uh, the farmland preservation program and then also the Penny Peck Farm, which we're looking to preserve. Um, I'm going to try and keep it brief for everyone today, but also subtly hinted at me keeping it brief. So this is actually a presentation I've uh, presented on several times in the past year, but have condensed that a little bit to not keep anyone too late here. So you can go ahead and get started. Um, and just the overall uh, farmland preservation um, in Pennsylvania, uh, the Pennsylvania Agricultural Conservation Easement Purchase Program was developed in 1988 uh, to help slow the loss of prime farmland to non-agricultural uses. This is all throughout uh, the state in 59 different counties. Um, funding typically every year, they set aside 35 to 40 million um, for their, their portion of the funding for farmland preservation. Um, and Pennsylvania is a national leader in farmland preservation. As of this past June, 6,076 farms were preserved in 59 different counties, uh, totaling over 613 thousand acres. Um, there's even more than this because this is only tracking the state funded um, farms in the state. Um, so there's oftentimes that a county might be the only one that funds the preservation of a farm. Um, so obviously that there would be more than this. And farming in Montgomery County itself. Um, our program started in 1990 and our first farms were preserved in 92. Um, the reason it takes a couple years is simply just the process. Um, we had um, a handful of farms apply to our program in 1990, but it takes about one to two years to actually preserve them just because of the process it has to go through all, all the different steps and whatnot. Um, more than 160 million has been put towards these preservation efforts. Um, and to date, Montgomery County has preserved over 180 farms on more than 10,300 acres. Uh, this represents slightly over about a third of our county's um, prime agricultural farmland. Um, and we have a very diverse, in my opinion, uh, range of farms that we have preserved, including dairy farms, equestrian centers, farms raising all different types of livestock. Uh, we have nurseries, which include Christmas trees, um, and then farms that just grow a variety of fruits and vegetables. Uh, and just some quick benefits of preserving farmland. First off, it's a financial help um, to the farmers and landowners. Uh, it's certainly an investment. A lot of these farmers um, are in debt. They have mortgages, things like that. Uh, so that helps them um, pay off their debts, pay off the mortgages. Um, but it's also an investment because they can put this money towards new equipment, new machi machinery, uh, which is ever growing in price right now. Um, you know, the equipment alone is very expensive. Um, and it's constantly evolving in technology um, and strategies and whatnot. So it's you know almost imperative that they stay up to date on you know the new technologies and the new machinery and everything to be as efficiently as possible. Um, it also assists landowners with estate planning and helps keep the farms in the family. Um, the land does stay in private ownership, so the owners continue to pay taxes on the land. Uh, simply, what we do is we just buy the development rights by purchasing the conservation easement. Um, so the landowner will still own the land, they're still going to pay the taxes. And preserved farmland is less expensive for the next generation of farmers to purchase. Um, kind of a problem we're running into right now, a lot of our farmers are getting to be uh, a little bit elderly. Um, they're looking to get out of farming and we need this young wave of new generation, uh, the younger farmers to come in. And land, machinery and everything is just simply too expensive right now. Um, so, you know, preserving the farmland does kind of help keep the cost of the land down, uh, which benefits the younger generation. Um, and undeveloped land requires less expenditures for future infrastructure and utilities. And then on a broader scale, um, 
you know, in terms of what the benefits are to preserving farmland, first and foremost, it's open space. You know, it, it helps with stormwater management, runoff erosion, helps municipalities meet their MS4 goals, uh, all things like that. It's habitat for wildlife and pollinators, as you can see right there, actually, in the bottom picture. That is a, a picture from one of our farmers. Um, three beautiful bucks right there laying in his cornfield, and, uh, you know, it provides a refuge for them. Um, you know, a lot of our farms have uh, beehives and everything, and it brings in pollinators. They have these wildflower fields, these meadows, sunflowers, things like that. Um, farms also contribute to the county's economic and sustainability effort. Um, and then the farm to table aspect. The more local farms we have, the more it's going to decrease our food miles and the carbon footprint. It's going to reduce our food insecurity uh, by providing the local healthy food, and it's just overall great for the local economy. And just briefly, what is the eligibility for the Farmland Preservation Program? Um, there's three sources that go into the funding. Again, it's the state, county, and then also the municipality. Uh, the municipality is totally voluntary, um, as Bill might know um, when I was speaking with him before. Um, to be state eligible, you do have to meet some of these qualifications here. You have to join a local ISA. There needs to be a certain amount of uh, soils uh, that are, are um, classified as high quality on their land. Um, and then they must be at least 35 acres or have at least 10 acres of farmland and be adjacent to perm permanently preserved land um, or have at least 10 farmed acres and grow a crop unique to the area. So those would be the things that would make a farm eligible for the state funding. Um, and then if they're not eligible for the state funding, again, we do also have county only funded farms um, and really the only requirement for that would be uh, they need at least 10 farmed acres of farmland and to also farm greater than 50% of their land. Next slide. Uh, and just very quick on how to apply to the program. Our application deadline is February 1st of each year. It's totally free to apply. Farmers don't have to pay anything to apply to us. Um, once we receive all the applications, uh, the staff, usually Ann and I, uh, we'll sit down and rank and score each applicant to the program, see where they kind of rank with each other, see how they qualify. Um, and then we present everything to our farm board who ultimately makes the decisions on which properties we're going to appraise. Um, sometimes we appraise all of them. Um, you know, sometimes we leave out a couple for various reasons. Um, and then in the summer, after we receive the appraisals back, we go on farm tours of all the applicants, uh, and then we eventually make offers by early summer. Um, and basically what we're paying right there is outlined in yellow. It's the market value of the property um, minus the value of the property as preserved, so just the, pro the value of the land. Um, and then we put, put pay the difference of that. That's the easement value. Um, so if, if a property is worth a million dollars to a developer, if you were to sell it at market value, um, and then the property is appraised at, say, $500,000 as you know, just the land, what's it um, you know, valued as, as preserved, um, we would offer the difference, 500000 And then uh, the landowners, they have the option of accepting the offer, rejecting our offer, or getting a second appraisal. Um, if they accept it, we just move forward with the process. If they reject it, no hard feelings. Um, they're more than welcome to apply again in future years. Um, and then they can get a second appraisal. If they were to get a second appraisal, it kind of extends their deadline a little bit. Um, and if uh, their second appraisal comes back higher than what we offer, uh, we kind of meet in a little middle ground. There's a state formula that we use. We kind of plug in all the numbers and come up with a new value. Um, when that's all said and done, uh, we submit things to the state. We eventually get the farm survey to determine the final acreage, um, and then we just move to settlement. And then after settlement, what happens after a farm is officially preserved, uh, we go on farm inspections uh, either annually or biannually. Basically what we're doing on these inspections is just to make sure that they're following their conservation practices, outlining their conservation plan, uh, make sure it's still being farmed, make sure it's still being well kept, things like that. Um, and kind of some stipulations in our guidelines. Um, a preserved farm is allowed a one additional residential opportunity. Um, so what we do is we allow a one-time subdivision of up to two acres on their property. Uh, these two acres can be used for an additional house um, which is strictly um, rest restricted to um, immediate family members or workers of the farm. Uh, we also allow for a subdivision of the preserved farm, 
the subdivisions must meet the criteria in our guidebook, and those farms must be 100 acres or greater. Um, and the landowners can um, obviously sell their farm. The only thing we ask is that they just you know notify us of the change of ownership within 30 days. And then right there at the bottom it says leasing. A lot of our landowners aren't even farmers. Uh, so what they do is they come in and they have a property and they would like to preserve their land as farmland. And what they do is they lease it out to local farmers who then come in and farm it. Um, so we certainly have a handful of landowners who are just living there and they lease their land out to farmers and that's how it gets, gets farmed. Um, so there's certainly many options that we allow for our farmers and landowners. And finally, this is kind of more so what we are here for. Um, College Settlement of Philadelphia, their property is outlined in blue up there on the screen. Uh, it's about 31.6 acres. College Settlement of Philadelphia leases this land to Pennypack Farm. Um, they've been there since 2003 running a CSA. Uh, that's pretty much how they generate their revenue and they grow all different types of fruits and vegetables. Last year they had 10 beehives that produced 320 pounds of honey. And then they have a you pick it section um, on their property where the public can come in and pick their own wildflowers and things like that. Um, and then if you notice the wooded section up there in the top left corner, uh, that corridor along Man Road is actually already under a natural land trust deed restriction. Uh, so even prior to our efforts of preserving this land, it was already restricted from development by the natural land trust. Um, and they also implement all different cover crops in the off season to help with soil health, uh, erosion control, great pollinator habitat, kind of the things I touched on earlier. Um, so that's pretty much their operation and what they do. And uh, you know, we made an offer to them uh, back in June. Um, you know, so we're just waiting to you know kind of keep that ball rolling. And um, that's really it. I'm more than happy to open this up to Q and A and answer any questions that council might have. Terry, Terry, you have any questions? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So about Sean or Mark? No, I appreciate the work you guys do. Thanks for the presentation. I'm good. Very good presentation. Thank you. So when you guys preserve property, a farm, if the uh, the farm goes out of business, um, stays under the same ownership, it's still permanently protected from development. Correct. If the owner then sells the property, that section of property is still protected from development. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is preserved in perpetuity regardless of how many ownership changes. Um, or if it's a farm or not. Well, it, 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 it must be a farm to be in our program. Yeah. But I think what you're saying is what happens if it stops, it gets yeah. sold, and the operation falls by the wayside? Farming operation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we do work with the farmers very closely. We also work with the state. Um, we certainly have a couple farms right now that kind of kind of went delinquent and you know went passive for a couple years. Um, you know, one that sticks out of my mind is they want to kind of switch to an organic farming operation. Uh, their previous farm that they've been leasing to didn't want to renew the lease. Um, you know, so we help them try to find farmers to keep the operation going. Uh, so you know, if there's a year or two to where it's not being farmed. We don't come in and find them or anything like that. We certainly work very closely with our farmers, um, help them as best we can, give them the resources to reach out to different people, different farmers, try to make the connection so they can find a new farmer and keep their land going. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. We appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Just <laughs> missed question. Um, just so so we know. Um, and we've been informed by you that um, the Penny Pack Farm and College Settlement is moving through your process. Um, could you take us, so what happened in June at the Farm Board, and then take us from that point, like what, what's the process? Um, we have not made the, we have made the offer privately to College Settlement of Philadelphia. Um, and we have, but we have not announced it publicly yet at a public farm board meeting. So, I'm not sure we're ready to announce the financials here at your public meeting. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not getting. I don't want you to get into the weeds of it. Just the process, like so. If if your board 
at a public meeting does, you know, make an offer. Like, what's it doesn't have to even be about college settlement. Um, so, what's at this point where the college settlement of property is? Um, what's the process from here on? Mm -hmm. So, if they were to accept our offer um, or get a second appraisal, and if we were to eventually come to an agreement on an offer, uh, basically what happens is we just enter an agreement of sale. We get all the documents together. We get our agreement of sale together. We get our deed together. Um, we have them sign the agreement of sale. We would have the township sign it if they were to um, provide funding. Same with the state. Um, and then basically we need to upload all that to the state by the end of the year for their approval and their review. Um, and then it just kind of continues throughout the process. Again, going back to getting surveyed um, and then eventually moving to settlement. So it's a one to two year process. It does take a while. Um, we, we, but I think the one thing that you didn't say is that we, we routinely reach out to municipalities to ask for their partnership in, in financially making that offer to the landowner. Um, so that's, I think, in part why we're here tonight. To, we don't preserve too many farms in Horsham. And so we wanted to make sure that you were all informed about what we do and why it's important. Um, you know, this is, I think, a, a more visible farm than a lot of the places that we, we visit. We have a lot of farms that, that cut hay and and you pass by it and you wouldn't notice it, but I think that Penny Peck has made quite a name for itself doing what they do here at this property. Yeah. <coughs> That's all I have. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item is uh, an opportunity for questions or comments. Does anybody in the audience have any questions or comments? Next item is our update on the PFAS water situation in Horsham. This is your uh, the monthly update. Um, act on June 15th, um, just last month, the EPA lowered their health advisory levels for two PFAS chemicals, PFOA and PFAS. Uh, the new health advisory level is 0 .004 parts per trillion for PFOA and 0 .02 parts per trillion for PFAS. Um, if everyone remembers, back in 2016, Horsham Township Council recognized the evolving science regarding PFAS chemicals and adopted a standard of non-detect for all PFAS compounds in Horsham's public drinking water supply. And in October 2019, the Horsham public drinking water um, met below detection levels. So n that's even lower than non-detect. So. Um, in October 2019, um, our water system reached below detection levels for PFAS compounds. So the EPA's 2022 announcement shows the wisdom that um, Township Council and our Horsham Water and Sewer Authority had back in 2016. Um, residents can rest assured that Horsham is providing the highest level of treatment possible for all PFAS compounds. Horsham is a national trailblazer and many water providers across the country will now be trying to move down the path already laid by Horsham Township. Um, and that's something, you don't want to be proud of water contamination, but how we handled the contamination, um, we should be pretty proud of. Um, and we do, myself and Tina down at the Water and Sewer Authority, uh, we do receive the calls from other um, states, towns, and cities around the country um, of what we did, how did we address it um, from not only um, the uh, filtration systems, but also public outreach, public education, marketing. Um, they were asking us all those questions. Um, the other uh, update is the next Restoration Advisory Board meeting is scheduled for Thursday, September 15th at 2022, 2022 at 6 p.m. And this one is back in person at the Horsham Township Library. It will not be virtual. Um, stormwater management update from the Navy, um, Pilot 1 um, uh, groundwater treatment system as of July 7th has treated 23.067 million gallons of water and their um, Pilot number 2 location off Horsham Road um, since July 7th, 2022 has treated 4.462 million gallons of water. Um, at the Air Guard Base, uh, their treatment system at the detention Basin as of June 20, 2022, um, has treated approximately 110 million gallons of water. 
Um, the PFAS health study is still looking for adults. Um, they're really concentrating on children. Um, they're doing pretty well with adults. Um, you know, their goal is 1,000 adults and 300 children to test. Um, they're doing pretty good, um, as I said, with adults. Um, they still need more, but they're doing okay with adults. But children are lagging. Uh, they are not getting many children to sign up for the health study. And as I said earlier, um, our system is still below detection levels, one of the safest public drinking water systems in the country. Thank you for that. To approve the um, council agenda meeting minutes. I move to approve the minutes as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, next will be aye. the treasurer. Next is the treasurer's report, please. Balance in the general fund as of June 30th, 2022 is $5,561,982.79. For the most part, the activity in all funds reflects budget expectations for June, with revenues in the general fund at 73.34% of budget and expenditures at 44.22% of budget. A total of 97.54% of budgeted real estate taxes have been received. The cost of inflation has started to affect our budget, especially in regards to fuel and utility cost. I expect this to continue to occur for the remainder of this year. We are monitoring it closely, and I do believe we will be able to manage the increased costs due to our conservative budgeting practices. For a more detailed presentation of our current financial position, I would refer you to your monthly booklet. Do we have a motion to approve the checks? I move to approve the list of checks in all funds in the amount of $437,986.02, and further move to authorize payment of the same. I move to ratify the U.S. Bank credit card transactions for the month of June 2022 in the amount of $11,762.81. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Uh, next will be to render a decision on the Outback Steakhouse 724 Blair, Blair Mill Road liquor license transfer. Uh, Mr. Walker. I move Walker. to adopt a resolution as proposed granting the applicant's request for approval of the transfer of liquor license R-11859 in Lower Marion Township for use at the Outback Steakhouse Restaurant at 724 Glenmill Road. Second. Moved and seconded. Before we vote, Mr. Gildea Walker, did you have any other comments on that? No, sir. Okay. And this is a roll call vote. Ms. Harmon, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. McCouch, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wade, how do you vote? Aye. And Mr. Whiteside, how do you vote? I vote aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Our next item is to consider an ordinance amending the township zoning ordinance to permit mini storage facilities. Uh, we need to table this for this evening. Mary, do we need a motion for that? Um, yes, I would make a motion to table it until July 25th. Make a motion to table the ordinance for a mini storage in Storage in 1 1 district for July 25th. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes aye. have it. Okay. Next, we need to consider a DCED letter of intent to request technical assistance for our fire and emergency services for the Horsham Fire Company. Uh, the, the, the local government uh, services division of the De Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, um, they have uh, free services, um, and some free services they offer are volunteer fire companies throughout the Commonwealth. And that they do multiple things for the fire companies. Um, in this instance, um, what our fire company is seeking, and it's not a grant, um, it's a free service that is offered to volunteer fire companies across the Commonwealth. Um, as everyone knows, the last 12 to 15 years, our fire company has been transitioning from a volunteer fire company to a career staff volunteer company. And as that progression is slowly continuing to happen, our, our fire company is just looking for some um, professional expert um, consulting and, and guidance on that transition. Um, they are not looking to merge with another company. They are not looking to expand outside the geographical limits of Horsham. They are looking for that internal operational um, uh, 
transition that they're looking for some guidance on. Um, and for them to be able to apply to DCED for this free service, the local municipality has to also sign the letter of intent. And that's really what it's about. Chief Greenberg is here to answer any questions or expand upon what I just said. Yep, I was about to ask you if you'd like to expand. I, I, Mr. Walker explained it quite well. I just, this is more of a self-evaluation of where we are. Um, to kind of to go along with what, what Mr. Walker already alluded to, um, we're, we're an organization in huge transition. And while we certainly think that we've done the, made the right moves at the right times with the with the right support from from people such as your fo as you folks um you, you know we we want to we want to seek the advice of professionals from at, from outside a disinterested third party if you will um so the best way to to do that is to solicit th their eyes and 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 get their comments on the way we operate and it's going to be a total uh, operational inclusion. Everything's going to be on the table um, to the point where I'm not even the one that's heading it up. I have one of the assistant chiefs heading it up because the chief is going to be evaluated. So um, it, is, it is completely an open book to these folks that are going to come in and, and do this evaluation. And obviously, we'll, we'll be sharing the, the, the findings. Um, it'll be a once it's approved it's quote unquote approved it, it will certainly be sharing the, the, the findings with with the uh, with, with council and certainly open it to the public for anybody that would want to see it and how long do these evaluations take um, it, it depends um, because we're doing it on ourselves and there's no there's no argumentative portions a lot of times townships put this all on the fire company to do and there's so it takes a lot longer since we're doing this and we're soliciting this and there's not going to be any argument or any um, we're hoping it's done in like six to nine months um, the, the longest part of this is is for them to write their findings um, they come out and they interview select people they'll, they'll interview uh, the officers select members old older members maybe members that are retired and and certainly I'm probably interview some of you folks as well so okay thank, thank you, you. Mm -hmm. all right then I guess at this point are there any other comments all right then do we have a motion I move, I move to approve the township manager to sign the letter of intent to the governor's center for local government services to request technical assistance for the Horsham fire company second moved and seconded all those in favor say aye aye aye, aye. Nice have it. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So, next we want to review the uh, following subdivision uh, Jansen Biotech, 800 Ridgeview Drive, 22-05-D. You folks want to come on up? Sure. As council, Council's aware, um, this is uh, Jansen um, Pharmaceuticals. Johnson & Johnson, they are located in our Commonwealth Corporate Center off Tordeman Drive. Uh, currently, they have two buildings and a parking garage, and they would like to add a third building that will join um, the two buildings by elevated walkways. Um, they did get, you did get your variances approved. I, I learned on my way here that yes, from the zoning hearing board. Solution, last night. They confirmed last so, night. That um, last there. night, they got the variances that they needed. They were in front of you for that review. Um, they also went in front of the uh, Township Planning Commission last week and they received uh, recommended um, preliminary final approval for their project and they are in front of you tonight to review their project with you and seek, I think, four waivers. Um, yes, but correct. Um, you can now introduce yourselves and present your plan. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, my name is John Wolko. I'm here for Jensen Biotech, uh, subdivision of Johnson & Johnson. I'm joined by George Hartman. Bowler Engineering and Jennifer Keller, the Director of Project Management uh, for Johnson & Johnson, who's familiar with the project in case there's any uh, you know, on-site questions about the operations. Um, as Mr. Walker uh, explained, uh, what we're hoping to present to you today and to receive approval for is this uh, amenities building that is joined to the two existing buildings on the property through elevated pedestrian bridges. Um, it's our hope that with this building it will provide better services to the employees that are uh, in those buildings right now by consolidating certain operations, whether it be food operations, meeting room operations, to allow more room for growth, 
uh, for office space within those existing buildings and, and allow Janssen to grow here in Horsham Township. Um, we did receive the variances uh, for the roof line height and the setback uh, height as, as was needed. Uh, we did receive the Planning Commission approval. Um, uh, without issue, they seemed very interested and appreciative of, of the um, desire to create this amenities building. Uh, we did receive uh, support for those waivers. Uh, I'm happy to go through those waivers. The engineer review letters are pretty clean. All the comments are, are will comply, uh, including the fire marshal. Um, so at this point, we're happy to answer any questions about what's being proposed um, and about the project or the operations in general. Uh, uh, you said all the Gilmore comments are will comply. Correct. Looks like you received support from uh, McCus McCluskey in favor and uh, Reeker. So why don't we go through those waivers? And Absolutely. So, so the first waiver is from uh, 198.18b2, which is the common to allow the aerial plan uh, to show the uh, necessary existing features within 400 feet. Um, I believe that's a common waiver, particularly with the site, which is surrounded on all sides by uh, the golf course. Um, and the, the Air Force Base on the one side. Uh, so that's just to use the aerial plans I believe you've, you've seen for here today. Terry, you okay with that? I'm fine. You guys online have any issues with that? All good. The second one is from 198.19, which is to do the joint preliminary final plan submission, uh, which again was approved by the Planning Commission. Everybody good I'm with fine. that? Fine. All good. Good. Number three. Uh, that's from 33 uh, D4, which is allowing parking areas within 20 feet of the walls of the building. And that's necessary because, as you recall, we're building this proposed amenities building on the existing <coughs> space that's being used for a parking garage. So it's not connected to the actual parking structure, but that parking structure is in proximity to the, the building. And I, I would just have Mr. Um, Hartman maybe give a little bit more details as to how it's set up between the parking spaces and the building. Sure, and, and that's the only area that that waiver applies to is, is sort of in the rear of the building where um, we have some parking spaces that kind of are directly behind the building. Um, when the, there's a portion of the existing parking garage that will get demolished, and the first thing they're gonna do is build a new wall on the end of the parking garage. It'll be a 12 inch thick concrete wall that'll be the new end of the parking garage. So that's what those parking spaces will be up against. The, then the building itself is actually a separate structure. Everybody okay? Fine. I'm fine with it. All right, then the last one. And the last one is from 33D8, which is to allow the nine by 18 parking spaces instead of the 10 by 20. Uh, currently throughout the, I believe the entire Commonwealth campus, the parking spaces are nine by 18, including within the parking garage. So. Uh, it's just to keep consistent with the current park, car, parking spaces uh, within the area. Okay. We good? Fine. I'm good. All right. Well, with that completed, what do we have to do next, Mary? Um, I'll prepare a resolution for approval and an agreement to accept conditions. I'll get those to you as soon as possible. And you can either be on the July 25th um, meeting or the second meeting in August, depending on when you can get the agreement to accept conditions sure. signed. I think what under the circumstances the end of July would work, obviously working with your schedule. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for your time. It's a great project. Thank you very much. Or to ribbon cutting. <laughs> skip, well, skip groundbreaking. We'll go right to ribbon cutting. <laughs> That's why we brought Jennifer, just so so she could hear her say that. Yeah. We love visitors. You, we're a small staff out at the at the construction trailers, but you're welcome to come join us. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Have a good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Okay, next, we need to consider introducing an ordinance amending Chapter 190 of the Township Codes of the Horsham Township Stormwater Management Ordinance. Uh, so um, we're scheduling a hearing for this, but simply uh, the state has a Stormwater Management Act, Act 167, and every so many years, two or three years, they make updates to that, um, their Stormwater uh, Management Act, and thus the municipalities in the across the Commonwealth have to, that have them have to update their stormwater management ordinances. So um, they made some tweaks. I think this is the first one in two or three years um, update that the state has done. 
So we now must um, comply with Act 167 of the state and update our stormwater management ordinance. And really, it's really just technical uh, terms within the ordinance. There's no change in um, quantities or anything like that for percentages for stormwater itself. So um, this is the draft ordinance, and then your next agenda item is scheduling the public hearing, which at that public hearing, um, the Township Engineer's Office will give you more of a presentation of the um, amendments and revisions. Okay, so do we, we have a motion? I move to introduce the ordinance as proposed, amending Chapter 190 of the Township Codes, the Horsham Township Stormwater Management Ordinance. Second. Moved and seconded. That's a roll call vote. Ms. Harmon, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. McCouch, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wade, how do you vote? Aye. And Mr. Whiteside, how do you vote? I vote aye. aye. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we have to set a time and a place, so do we have a motion for that? I move to adopt the resolution as proposed, establishing a time and place for a public hearing on an ordinance amending Chapter 190 of the Township Codes, the Horsham Township Stormwater Management Ordinance, Wednesday, August 10th, 2022, at 7.45 p.m. in the Horsham Township Building. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. It's a roll call vote. Ms. Harmon, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. McCouch, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wade, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Whiteside, how do you vote? I vote aye. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we need to consider a lease agreement with Verizon to locate antennas on the Township Tower at 1005 Horsham Road. So as, as council's aware, um, about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago now, um, Montgomery County Department of Public Safety, that, um, they, that one of their responsibilities is the 911 system across, the, across our county, um, they installed and built, constructed a tower, um, which is shown on the screen now, at our public works facility. Um, and that tower provided 911 coverage for police, fire, and ambulance and services in um, this area of the county, um, they they upgraded their system, um, basically changed over uh, their system completely. Um, they abandoned this tower in December of 2020, um, and um, they uh, asked us if we were interested in it for any reason. And we, as a township, um, we do not need it for anything. Um, but our thought process was, as you know, um, we have these cell companies come at us every once in a while. Sprint, Nextel, T-Mobile, Verizon, um, looking to put new towers up. And new towers aren't really popular with neighborhoods, residents of the community that see them. So um, we decided to uh, um, take ownership of the tower from the county. Um, the ownership of the tower changed in July of 2021, actually 12 months ago. Um, so we became the owners of the tower. Um, and just as we thought and planned, um, Verizon came along looking for a tower location for antennas in this area. Uh, we directed them and we showed them this tower, um, existing tower, and uh, they looked at it, they evaluated it with their uh, structural engineers and also their technical crew, and this works for them. So um, what's in front of you tonight is a lease agreement with Verizon for them to locate antennas on our tower. Um, so, and we will get a small um, monthly lease um, payment from them that would amount to about $26,000, $27,000 a year. Um, and uh, so we'll get a little bit of revenue, but more importantly, um, having the forethought and thinking that um, uh, taking ownership of the tower, we stopped another brand new tower for being constructed somewhere around in this area in Horsham Township. So in front of you tonight is the lease agreement for Verizon to get Verizon going to get their antennas on the tower. Do we have a motion? I move to approve the lease agreement with Verizon to locate antennas on the Township Tower at 1005 Horsham Road. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Next, we need to consider a resolution establishing a time and place for a public hearing on the Aqua Pennsylvania to Blair Mill Road conditional use application. Monday, August the 22nd, 2022, 
at 7 p.m. in the Horsham Township Municipal Building at 25 Horsham Road. So Aqua PA owns a drinking water well. Um, it's on the Hepper Little League Complex uh, at Blair Mill and County Line Road. And what they would like to do is um, put a um, filtration treatment system on that well, um, similar to what we've done on our wells. Um, they, um, and in order to do that, uh, they're in a section of the repairing corridor um, and to build a structure in those zones, um, they need a conditional use um, hearing. So that's what the hearing would be about. Do we have a motion? I move to adapt the resolution as proposed, establishing Monday, August 22nd, 2022 at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Township Building as a time slash place for a public hearing on the conditional use application for 2 Blair Mill Road. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. It's a roll call vote. Ms. Harmon, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. McCouch, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Wade, how do you vote? Aye. And Mr. Whiteside, how do you vote? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Next item is to authorize the solicitation of a bid for the Whitmer Road Basin retrofit. You want to tell us a little bit? Uh, this is part of our um, MS4 requirements. Um, this is one of our first projects, uh, I would say a year one project, but it's going to be taking the basin on Whitmer Road, which is um, between College Settlement Camp and Country Road, um, and retrofitting that to a um, bioretention basin to improve um, stormwater quality. I think the stormwater quality is the main thing. Um, but it'll also be designed to hold it back, I think, a little bit more water um, in the uh, Penny Pack watershed um, when we get those heavy major storms. And Dennis is heading up that project, so I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, Dennis. Hey, then do we have a motion? I move to authorize a solicitation of bids for the Whitmer Road Basin retrofit and further authorized advertisement of the same. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 I have it. Uh, with that, we have no further business, so do we have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, guys. <laughs>